others who are costly deeds having to live in lives because I'm being evicted from the bunker since it is not my primary residence. <laughs> well, we can stall them for a year. <laughs> This is an old number that is once again current and timely. It's called a mop for my own business. Drilling a line between the Johnsons and the ships. Now this plant could be a reasonably pleasant place to live if everyone could just mind his own business and let others do the same. But a wide old black faggot said to me years ago, some people are shit stars. <laughs> I was never able to forget it. Now the shit is incapable of minding his own business, because he has no business of his own to mind. And the mark of a hardcore shit is that he has to be right. He is a professional miner of other people's business, and he is compulsively and vociferously right. A prime example of the genre is the late Harry J. Anslinger, former commissioner of narcotics. <laughs> the laws must reflect society's disapproval of the addict. Such people poison the air, we all breathe with the blight of their disapproval. Southern law men feeling their nigger notches. Decent church gone women with those pinched, mean, evil faces. <laughs> Any form of maintenance is immoral, he says. And of course, thus rejecting the obvious solution to the so called drug problem, which is uh, maintenance for those who can't or won't stop using drugs and treatment for those who want to. Now, Johnson, on the other hand, minds his own business. He doesn't rush to the law if he smells pot in the hall. He don't care about the call girl on the second floor, the bags in the back. However, he will give help when help is needed. He won't stand by when someone is drowning or trapped under a burning car. And above all, he will not stand by when animals and children are being abused. He figures things like that is everybody's business. <laughs> now along comes Regan and Nancy, hand in hand. <laughs> no one has the right to mind his own business. <laughs> Difference is not an option. Only outspoken insistence that drug use will not be tolerated. Everyone is obligated to become hysterical at the mere thought of drug use. <laughs> Just as office workers and deaths a year. And crime producing drug, my God. So you're going to rush into Washington cocktail parties screaming your drug use is intolerable. As for the sly traffickers and alcohol bloated with dirty money, go speeding on the dead. They deserve the death penalty at least. <laughs> What's well, just ridiculous and disquieting to speculate what may lurk behind this colossal red herring of the war against drugs. Actually, drug use is down, according to the latest st statistics. Unreliable, to be sure, they always are. Uh, a, a war neither likely are designed to succeed. Looks like old clean money and new dirty money will be shaking hands under the table as usual. <laughs> and the old tried and failed police approach will continue. In politics, if something doesn't work, that is the best reason to go on doing it. 
If something looks like it might work, stay well away. A thing like that can make waves. And the boys at the top, they don't like waves. Fifty years ago, deep in the Ural Mountains of Lower Slobovia, a 13-year-old prick named Pavlik Marat denounced his father to the local authorities as a counter-revolutionary kulak. Got a pig head in his face. Now that was when uh, Stalin was starving out the kulaks. Now a kulak is a subsistence farmer, a few acres and a few animals. And Stalin leveraged an outrageous produce tax, knowing that the farmers would hide their crops. Then he sent out patrols to search and seize concealed produce and farm animals. About seven million people starved to death in the winters of 1932 and 33. Three million of them children. Little Pavlicki was hacked to Stroganov by the outraged neighbors. Good job at all. Thus perish all talking assholes. <laughs> His name must not die, sir, Moxing Gordy. Jesus, how low can a writer sing? <laughs> His heart is acting like painful emotion. So Pavlicki becomes a folk hero. Got a street in Moscow named after him, and a statue. He should have been sculpted with the face of a rat. <laughs> the village of Gerasimovka is a shrine drawing legions of youthful pilgrims to perform a public marazzo. Dirty little stokash. That's Ruski for rap. That's a great word. It's a word designed to be spit out. <laughs> he may be a folk here of the islands. He's just a lousy thing to me. <laughs> and it is happening here. Journal World, October 29. <laughs> Girl 10 reports mother's drug use. It's the fourth time a California girl had turned in her parents for, a lot, for alleged drug, drug abuse since August 13th. My mother got a mint one plant growing in a pot. <laughs> and me says that management has the responsibility for surveillance of problem areas such as locker room, toilets above all. And nearby taverns and the toilets in the taverns to prevent drug use. It looks to me like Meese and Reagan intend to turn the United States into a nation of rats. <laughs> this is my reconstruction of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not be such a shit you don't know you are one. <laughs> My God, I acted like an absolute shit. <laughs> if so, let him stand forth so that we may acclaim a latter day saint. <laughs> Don't anyone look at me, for God's sakes. I call an interview with a weakness reporter. He said, Mr. Burroughs, is there anything in your life you regret? Anything you would do differently? You have it to do over. commerce of the 
soul, no experience. Young thief thinks he has a license to steal. Young lawyer never botched a case. Young doctor never killed a patient. Politicians, however, cannot concede that they ever acted any way but the right way. Lying comes as natural as breathing to a politician, <laughs> and just about essential for his survival. <coughs> Thou shalt not drop an atom bomb or shit one out in the first place. <laughs> Robert Oppenheimer, known as Obi to his friends. <laughs> you got an atom bomb for a friend, uh, your only enemy is a dud. <laughs> and Obi heard, about, heard the good news about Hiroshima, he said, thank God it wasn't a dud. What God are you thanking for Hiroshima, Oppenheimer? And Truman said, God has given us the other mom, and he will show us how to use it. Oh, my God. <laughs> it is to be remembered that on the occasion of the first atomic explosion at Alamogordo, New Mexico, that translates roughly as fat soul. So on this fat occasion, Robert Oppenheimer, the founding father, entertained the possibility of a chain reaction that would ignite the atmosphere. You're theorizing way over our heads, uh, Oppenheimer, said the general, and speaking for the Pentagon, I don't like it. <laughs> Twenty years later, Opie still believed that nuclear fission would destroy the planet. We are become death, shatter of shatterer of worlds, he said. He said it on TV and wiped the tear out of the corner of his eye with a long, skinny finger he was dying of cancer at the time. And various highly placed officials appeared to say it was a very difficult decision. They're talking about the decision to drop the atom bomb on Hiroshima. And I thought, God defend us all from a difficult decision in the Pentagon. <laughs> Nobody does more harm than people who feel bad about doing it. <laughs> so one goes on signing the petitions and supporting nuclear freezes, what else can one do? One sounded a word of warning. Brian Geisen had the old term, the all purpose nuclear bedtime story. Some trillions of years ago, a sloppy, dirty giant flicked grease from his fingers. One of these gods of grease is our universe on its way to the floor. <laughs> Meanwhile, life such as it is goes on, and I am frequently asked if I have any words of advice for young people or people of any age. Uh, perhaps the most important lesson a man can learn is this. Winning and losing comes in streaks. That's the law of gambling. Plunge when you win and fold when you lose. Like Jesus said, to him that hath shall be given, and from him that hath not shall be taken, even that which he hath when he starts doubling up in a losing streak. <laughs> That's the law of life. Uh, good things and bad things, and bad things come in streaks. So ride your winning streak, but don't ride it too far and too fast, or you may hit a losing streak at high velocity. <laughs> when you are losing, reach rich, economize, stay home. <laughs> now here are a few uh, simple rules on the lever, on the lever.
parable of Lord Chesterton's uh, letters to his son, Practical Worldly Advice. Never interfere in a boy and girl fight. Beware of whores who say they don't want money. <laughs> Hell, they don't. What they mean is they want more money. <laughs> These are the most expensive whores what can be got. If you are doing business with a religious son of a bitch, get it in the right his word isn't worth a shit. The good Lord telling him how to fuck you on the deal. If, after being exposed to someone's presence, you feel as if you lost a quart of plasma, avoid that. You need it like you need pernicious anemia. You don't like to hear the word vampire around the air. It's hard to improve our free arm. Interdependence is the word. Enlightened interdependence. Like, you know, it's rich variety. Take a little, leave a little. However, by the inexorable logistics of the vampiric process, they always take more than they leave in Wine Beach if they take any. Avoid fuck ups. <laughs> Food, I call them. You all know the type. Everything they have anything to do with turns into a disaster. <laughs> Trouble for themselves everyone connected with them. A boo is bad news and it rubs it off. Don't let it rub off on you. Do not proper sympathy to the mentally ill. Bottomless pit. Tell them firmly, I am not paid to listen to this dribble. You are a terminal fool. Special malignant strain of who? Look what Norman Mailer got himself into by involving himself with that art. Typical criminal fool, Jack and Adam. Boy, listen to this. Full in this book. I would sell my soul for freedom, but I won't give an honest day's work or, behave, or behave myself for an instant for that same thing. Surely, Abbott is the foolish to the Dead Souls. This is a film idea loosely suggested by a science fiction book. Uh, Dead Souls postulates that the soul is an electromagnetic field designed to occupy and activate a certain organism. While infinitely less vulnerable than the artifact it occupies, the soul can be dispersed and destroyed by a nuclear blast. <laughs> this was, in fact, the ultra secret and super sensitive function of the atom bomb, a soul killer. <laughs> to alleviate an escalating soul blood stacked up like cordwood and non-recyclable by the old hellfire expedient like fucking plastics. Ruins of Hiroshima on screen. Pull back to show the technician at a switchboard. Behind him, Robert, Robert Oppenheimer, flanked by middle-aged men in dark suits with a cold, dead look of heavy power. The technician twills his knob. Oh, clear. Are you sure? The instruments say so. Opie says, thank God it wasn't a dud. Oh, uh, hurry up with those printouts, Joe. Yes, sir, he looks after them sourly. Thank Joe it wasn't a dud. God doesn't know what the button stuff was. <laughs> However, some tough young souls, horribly maimed and very disgruntled, do survive the Hiroshima and come back to endanger national security. 
So the scientists are put to work to devise a super soul cure. No job too dirty for a fucking scientist. <laughs> we talk to them when there are some laboratory accidents. Run for your lives, gentlemen, a purple eyes, a baboon, a survive, 23 is good to do with the most savage animal on earth. The incandescent baboon soul rips through a steel door like white paper. Uh, you have to vaporize the installation, lost expensive equipment and personnel, irreplaceable, some of them. Real soul boom chefs, you might say, cordon blur. <laughs> An interesting detail from the book, the soul killer gives off the smell of burning plastic and rotten oranges. Anything so bizarrely arbitrary is good enough to steal. I'll be reading this on trashy sci-fi spy unspeakable horror and suddenly I do a double take and I yelp out, gets, 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 good enough to steal. Here's one, a dry, rustling laugh like a snake shedding its skin, gets, gets, gets. <clears throat> well, trial and error, we now have soul killers that don't quit. Stay to the part. Sure, the big part. We know how it's all gonna end. The first sound, the last sound. Meanwhile, all personnel on planet Earth confined to quarters. <coughs> Convincing they got no souls. It's more humane that way. Science always said there is no such thing as a soul, and they are now in a position to prove it. <laughs> soul death, soul death. It's what the Egyptians call the second and final death. This awesome power to destroy souls forever is now vested in far-sighted and responsible men in the State Department, the CIA, and the <laughs> President, with his toadies and familiars, is now 500 feet down in solid rock. With enough fine food, wines, and liquors to last 200 years and the longevity drugs to enjoy. <laughs> A teenage president appears on TV as well cut suit hanging loose on his skinny frame to pipe out in adolescent treble, alternately pompous and cracking. We categorically deny that there are any crack. So called fountain of youth drugs, <laughs> procedures, our treatments that are being held back on the American people crack. He flashes a boyish smile and runs a comb through his abundant, unruly air, and I categorically dismiss as without foundation that I myself, the First Lady, <coughs> and my fag son, <laughs> and my colleagues in the cabinet, are sustaining ourselves by state-of-the-art vampiric technology. <laughs> Showing off the American pimples crack, giggle, so-called energy units. <laughs> His hair stands up and crackles and he gives the American people a finger. <laughs> I got mine. Fuck you, every crumb for itself. Cambridge, Mass, 1938, Kells Evans and your reporter were writing a shipwreck story based on the sinking of the Titanic and also on the moral castle disaster. Uh, the captain went down to his ship. It was a maiden voyage and a number of rich and fancy people on board, and I think it was Mr. Astor. He and his valet put on full dress suits and said, we are going down like gentlemen. Blub, blub, blub. <laughs> so old King Colonel Clint Smith was right on the deck when the Titanic went down, got clear, and latched onto a chicken coop and survived. And that's the name of the game. Speaking of which, this is a quote. 
Somewhere in the shadow of the titanic disaster slinks a cur in human shape. Today, the most despicable human being in all the world. In that grim midnight hour, he found himself hemmed in by the band of heroes whose watchword rang out across the deep. Women and children first. What did he do? He scuttled to the stateroom deck, put on a woman's skirt, a woman's hat, and a woman's veil. And picking his crafty way back among the brave and chivalric men who guarded the rail of doom ship, he built a seat in one of the lifeboats and saved his skin. <laughs> his identity is not yet known, but it will in good time. This man still lives. Surely he was born and saved to set for men a new standard by which to measure into man shame. <coughs> Um, I don't know, that. I don't know if they ever found him or not. <laughs> in our story, Twilight's last leavings, the ship's captain puts on women's clothes and swishes into the first lifeboat. And also in this lifeboat is the ship's captain. This was the first appearance of Dr. Fenway. <laughs> Twilight's last leaving the SS America off Jersey Coast. Ladies and gentlemen, there is no cause for alarm. We have a minor problem in the boiler room, but everything is now under the sound effects of a nuclear blast. <laughs> Explosion splits the boat. A brief named Perkins screams from his uh, shattered wheelchair. You get the ass on a bit. <laughs> Dr. Benway, ship's doctor, drunk. Only added two inches to a six inch incision with one stroke of his gavel. Perhaps the appendix already out, Doctor. The nurse said during duties way over his shoulder, I saw a little scar. And it's out? <coughs> Take him the appendix. What are you not doing? Perhaps the appendix on the left side, Doctor. That's happened sometimes, you know. <laughs> Doc, breathing down my neck, I'm kind of that. I'm sure they kind of know where I know. I started up in Dachyman in 1904 at Harvard. He lifted the abdominal wall and searched along the incision, dropping ashes on the cigarette. He thrust a red fist at her. And get me a new scandal. This one's got no edge to it. The doctor flattened against the wall. The patient slid off the operating table, spilling intestines across the floor. So up, I can't be expected to work under such conditions. <laughs> but instruments cocaine and morphine into his satchel and tilted out of the operating room. Mike Dwyer, politician from Clayton, Missouri, rushed into the first class lounge. He crossed the jukebox, selected the star spangled banner with Pat's terminal at the electric organ, and set it on a handful of quarters. Oh, say, can you see Captain Kramer putting the finishing touches to heavy makeup? <laughs> now, a green cloak hat and a fox stole one of those horrid creations where the fox's mouth forms a class. Rather say Thompson, he decided, slipping a 32 automatic into his handbag. By the dawn's early light, Dr. Benway pushed her across the rail and boarded the first lifeboat. Y'all, right, he said, seating himself among the women, I'm a doctor. <clears> or <throat> the ramparts, we watch the captain stiff arms an old lady and fills the first lifeboat. <laughs> Holds his lowered jerkily by male passengers, Dr. Benway Castle. Our flag was still there. Shipwreck, <clears throat> something folks don't like to talk about. Uh, people keep trying to get in lifeboats that are already full, and some of them have to cut their fingers off with a butcher knife. <laughs> in our story, a paralyzed critic, uh, paralyzed in the waist down, one of his hands, is the instrument someone gives him the knife and tells him what to do. <clears throat> A hand reaches.
reaches out and closes it on the boat side, spring like, perking springs down the night. The hand slips away, finger stubs fall into the boat. And a boy, comrade, don't let him swamp us. The crew pull on the oars, Perkins works feverishly, cutting on all sides. His false teeth fly out with the speed of a smacking snake. Knocks him back into his mouth. Bastard, bunch of bitches, bastard, bunch of bitches. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave? Barbara Cannon showed your reporters her souvenirs of the disaster. A light belt autographed by the crew with a severed human finger. <laughs> I don't know, she said. I feel so bad about this old finger. For oh, the love of the free and the home of the free. Uh, I've been reading a lot of these doctor books. Dr. Benway really shines forth as a model of responsibility and confidence. <laughs> and they're mostly written by doctors, and I'm not totally surprised at the extent to which the, uh, the uh, German medical profession has collaborated with the Nazis. Well, here's a comparative. Innocuous specimen. Mike said him some final diagnosis. Empty as an empty waiting room. This wretched specimen is fallen for a 19 year old nurse. They made it out of her own closet and reek of Mr. Clean. He has proposed, she has accepted. Then she comes down with bone cancer. They have to take off the left leg, scat, scapels cross it has and spread. Does he still want her? She tells him to take five days and think it over. He does. With bleak clarity, he sees the years to come in little flashes. Oh, yes, he can see where his own interests are involved. He is striding towards surgery. Big man on camp, on complex now. It takes gut to practice surgery, he said. <clears throat> striding towards surgery, though the patient is clearly terminal. He went operate on the mummy. And she is shamming along on her prosthetic. Will you shake the lead out? I'm doing the best I can, darling. Why don't you go back to her clutches, he thinks irritably aloud. He says, why don't you jet the pill on your stinking parts? <laughs> Admittedly, his words are somewhat on a time. But cancer does. Of course, it's not her fault she is in this loathsome condition, or is it? His mother always said, Son, in this life, everyone gets exactly what they want and exactly what they deserve. People tend to believe it, so long as they are getting what they think they deserve. <clears throat> Incongruously, Mike thinks of an old joke, the eternal traveling salesman. So, agonist the eternal dirty joke. The salesman spots an attractive woman in the club car. As fate would have it, she is in the lower bunk just opposite his upper bunk. And he is given in the eye. She takes off her wig. She pops out her glass eye. She spits out her false teeth. She unhooks her wooden leg. <laughs> Looks up at him perfectly and says, Is there anything you want? You know what I want. Take it off and throw it up there. <laughs> he starts laughing. She demands why. And finally, he tells her, and she hits him with her throat snapping for a five stitches. <laughs> the medical rights of 1999. It is estimated that 10,000 doctors, medical bureaucrats, directors of pharmaceutical companies were massacred in the week of the long scaffolds. The killings were not by any means random, the rioters had a list. There's the bastard letting pass a kidney stone in the emergency room. It stacked up and up unnecessary operations, getting patients dying in the emergency room. We cannot accept medical emissions from emergency. Animals, uh, ambulance calls, district.
the garden, potentially beneficial and harmless products and treatments kept off the market. Lethal products kept on the market. The recent example was the so-called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for arthritis. In England, eight people died of liver failure, and they just don't take it off the market. They just keep changing the tray name. It was the Burns in a walkout set it off. Now, I have this from nurses who have worked in burn units. Absolutely no morphine or other painkiller is ordered for the patients. Otherwise, there could be danger of addiction for patients who may be under treatment for months. Even the dying are denied morphine if they have the misfortune to die in the burn unit. But doctor, my nurse and woman protest, the patients will be dead in 12 hours. Don't you think I know that? This is the burn unit. We are under burn unit rules. Every day, burn unit patients have the raw cavities scrubbed up with a stiff brush and the patients scream with agony and few nurses can take it. A team amateur astronauts who call themselves the spacers landed in the burn unit when their homemade space rocket exploded. After the first scrub, they issued an ultimatum morphine every four hours or we walked out. What is this nonsense? There will be no morphine. You're not going anywhere. Meet my brother, the lawyer, doctor. You propose to hold these people against their will? For their own goods. If they leave the hospital, they will be dead in 10 days from infections. And they set up a private clinic in the law. And there was a clash with police raiders searching for narcotics. Three patients shot to death. And the walkout spreads like a forest fire. Morphine a walk. Mow, mow, mow. Knocked us all the ground uneasily like camels scenting danger. In 17th century London, everybody got fed up with the lawyers, and the cry went up, kill all the bloody lawyers. <laughs> Whereupon, even the most elderly and infirm scrambled off with the agility of rats or evil spirits. Hampered by the inflated self-image, the healers did not quit themselves so well. What are we waiting for, a hospital bed? Kill all the fucking croakers. Security steps nimbly aside and the crowds rush in. Now this piece, uh, I just want to say that it's, um, doesn't reflect my uh, opinions at all, but it's uh, sort of the official wasp um, position, um, and I've had considerable experience with people of this genre. <laughs> I nominate the most flatly discussed passage in current fiction, the typical interview between the young intelligence agent and the chief. When Peter walked into the office, the chief smiled. Agents have been known to get frostbite from the chief smile. Having trouble with you, boy? He's a bit standoffish, said Peter. Sure, he is. We'll treat a kike like a Jew and treat a high class Portuguese Jew like a kike. Come right after that. You want to get into a nice genteel country club? Well, we like nice Jews without moms and Jew jokes. Oh. Peter could see the chief as some cod-eyed old exterminator. He squirmed, squirmed with a small seven and broke out wholesomely. I'm just beginning to realize what a cold-hearted bastard you are. The chief was pleading. He couldn't help squirming a little, but his voice was cool. Well, that's one way of putting it. I call it staying on top of an island. Casualties could run into the millions. The billions, Peter, the billions. The chief spread his hands and smiled. Outsiders, none of our people will be touched. Operation Bunker. 
Just long enough for things to cool down, and then we emerge like the phoenix without, of course, the inconvenience of being burned. Just drop a few hints, room in the bunker for the right kind of juice. You know what I mean, right juice. Ah, they tell me Portuguese juice is the best kind, like Portuguese oysters. He just swore this was true greatness. You can't fake the real thing. You are a cold-hearted bastard, he ejaculated. Why down and back? Um, any trouble with a cracker boy? Not a peep. I gave him the old white smalls right down the line like you told me. What are you doing over there with a nigger in the age? Why don't you come over here where you belong and act like a white man? <laughs> he swallowed that, did he? I thought he would. Well, I guess it's in the rag, Mary. One menstruating consent to another, then the chief smiles. So dirty. Is Colonel Bradfield's job to investigate the practical potentials of ESP, sorcery, witchcraft, or not? He doesn't give a shit for natural laws or what is or is impossible. All he cares about are results. Bring me the ones that work. What'd you bring this old beast in here for? A withered old man dressed only in a loincloth, stiff with yellow piss stains, stinking like a snake cave in spring, sits down in a leather armchair. Fumigating the chair will be inadequate, Colonel decides. He's a natural chief. He can throw an operative curse. I don't doubt it. He can kill by proximity. <laughs> Got a good track record, Chief. Sure, sure, 80 years in the making. So how did he get that way? To be a magician, you've got to be inhuman in some way. Easiest way is to eat your own shit and eat it steady. Eat it in and shit it out. Eat it in again, gets evil and dirty, a stink nobody can smell and live. <laughs> No trace. No way it can be traced to us. What the hell there isn't. You'll think the islands aren't into this shit up to the ass. They can make up the evidence we all do it. No way to trace it. Big deal. Eighty shit-eating years to turn out one old human sympathy can throw a curse if you hold him steady on target. I can train an agent in hours with untraceable poisons and toxins. Electronic devices to produce irrhythmical heartbeats in sleep. He died in his sleep, dreaming about a beautiful, deadly woman. See what I mean? We don't need it. But she, we can't throw away like anything like this. And indeed, where can we throw it? It's radioactive. Get it out of here for starters and take the chair out with it. <laughs> Yes, folkloric text from the Federal Narcotics Hospital at Lexington, Kentucky, was inspired by the words of Juvenal, the ancient Roman satirist, uh, referring to Greek parasites and cyclones. A few weeks later, a warm, he breaks into a sweat. If you complain of a draft, he screams for his overcoat. There is an exclusive wing at Lexington reserved for the do rights who are considered good rehabilitation prospects, they get better rooms and more medication. And a do right always shows up with letters from his employer and clergyman and congressman. You know, the type falls all over himself to like the boss's cigarette. The doctor walks into the ward, rather warm in here. There's one man that do rights break out in a sweat and rush around opening windows. A bit cold in here, isn't it? Immediately, the do right see their breath in the air, snatch blankets, and funnel themselves up to a chorus of shattering teeth. Front talkers, brown nose, pink to the bone. Doctor, well, I don't want to be buried right in the same coffin with you. You're the finest, the most decent, the most deep humane man I've ever known. I'm 
put you down for additional medication or something. Thank you, doctor. Push it to receive the death penalty. It's the old army game from a year to eternity. Get there first just with a brown as no. Go <laughs> down the dim gray wards and day rooms where they do wrong, talk and spit and shiver and vomit. Fucking Crocker wouldn't give me a goo ball. He asked me what the American flag means to me, and I tell him, suck it in heroin, doc, and I'll suck it. <laughs> See, the chapel gets straight to Jesus. And then, the tears streaming down their lousy pink faces, the do rice leap up as one man and bellow out the star spangled banner. <laughs> Consider the impasse of one God universe. He can't go anywhere since he is already everywhere. He can't do anything since the act of doing presupposes opposition. He can't exert energy since he is omnipotent. His universe is irrevocably thermodynamic, having no friction by definition. So he has to create friction, war, fear and death to keep his dying show in the road. And sooner or later, look, boss, we don't have enough energy left to fry an elderly woman in a flea bag hotel pot. <laughs> we only have to start faking it. Sure, I need the details to Joe. Look, for a real disaster, you get a pig of energy. Sacrifice, heroism, grief, separation, fear, and violent death. So from an energy surplus, you can underwrite the next one, but if the first one is a fake, you can't underwrite a shithouse. Try to explain to God Almighty where he is, one God universe is going. Asshole doesn't know what buttons to push or what happens when you push them. Abandon shit, God damn it, every man for himself. <laughs> And what's your life for, boss? The old spot fix it. What with a band-aid and chewing gum, leaking the master film. Fix it yourself, boss man. <laughs> like the last Gatsby, Kim believes in the green light, the orgy of the future. He believes in the magical universe, unpredictable, spontaneous, alive, a universe where anything is possible. A universe of many gods, often in conflict. So the paradox of an all-knowing, all-powerful God, who nonetheless permits suffering, evil, and death, does not arise. We got a family here, Osiris, what happened? Well, you can't win them all, I'm hustling myself. Can you give us immortality? Well, I can give you an extension, maybe. Take you as far as the first checkpoint. You will have to make it from there on your own. Most of them don't. Figure about one in a million, and biologically speaking, that's very good odds. Thank you. Cup by swishing it around in the toilet bowl. <laughs> the nurse 
Shouldn't it be sterilized, doctor? <laughs> Very likely, but there's no time. Sits <laughs> on the suction cup like a king, see, watching his assistant make the incision. You young squirts couldn't lance a pimple without an electric vibrating scalpel with automatic drain and suture. All the skill is going out of surgery. Oh, no, I'll make do. Let me tell you about the time I performed an appendectomy with a rusty sardine can. Once I was caught short without an instrument, one and removed a neuron tumor with my teeth. <laughs> uh, well, that was in the upper appendix, and besides, I want you to Doctor, if the incision is ready, Doctor, Doctor Benway pushes the cup into the incision and works it up and down. Blood spurts all over the nurse, the doctors, and the wall. The cup makes a horrible sucking sound. <laughs> I think she's gone, Doctor. <laughs> well, it's all in the day's work. He walks across the room to a medicine counter. Some bestial drug addict has cut my cocaine with Santa Claus. <laughs> Send the boy out to fill this RX on the double. Please remember to like and subscribe for more thought engineering from Polytechnica. Thank you.